Welcome to the Model Health Show. This is fitness and nutrition expert, Sean Stevenson, and I'm so grateful for you tuning in with me today. You know, so many of us, when we're looking to change our physical health or our relationships or our financial health, we're really looking for a transformation. That's the word that comes to mind. I actually love, love this word personally. And I wanted to share the definition with you guys really quickly. And transformation is to change form, appearance, or structure to metamorphosis. Another one is to change in condition, nature, or character. And I really like this one. And this is the definition from physics. It says, to change into another form of energy. How cool is that? Now, when I think about transformation, there's a certain person that comes to mind who's absolutely an expert in transformation. And he might, have, he might be the number one person in the world in helping people to transform. And we have him on the show today. Now, before we get into the episode, I want to give a quick shout out to our show sponsor, Four Sigmatic. Thank them for helping me to get in for this early episode of this very, very special episode where we had a guest in studio, Four Sigmatic, supply my coffee this morning. All right. And I'm just a recent convert, transformation, it's another word for transformation, to coffee because Four Sigmatic has really made it special, made it easy. Are you still drinking regular coffee? Why would you do that? All right. This is a mushroom coffee. And this one had lion's mane, which the University of Malaya has found that lion's mane is one of the very few substances ever discovered to have neuroprotective effects. So we're talking about literally protecting your brain cells from all of the stressors that we're combating today. There are very few things that can do that. Also, this combination had the, the coffee, lion's mane, and chaga. Now, chaga is one of the most studied mushrooms for its anti-cancer effects. Now, if you look at the research, you see that chaga has about, when you take chaga, 300% increase in your natural killer cell activity. So these are your immune system weapons. It's like, I just saw, it popped up on my computer and I saw Ninjago on my computer because my six-year-old was watching it. It's like Ninjago training for your immune cells, all right? Making your immune cells more capable of battling any type of nefarious substance that might be in your system, all right? So how potent is that? This is huge upgrade from that regular old Folgers in your cup, all right? So head over, check them out. It's foursigmatic.com forward slash model. You're going to get 15% off all of their incredible mushroom coffees, mushroom elixirs if you're not into the coffee, and also they have some really cool mushroom mushroom blends as well. So foursigmatic.com forward slash model. That's F-O-U-R-S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C.com forward slash model model 15% off. And on that note, let's get to the iTunes review of the week. Another five-star review titled Health Food for the Brain by SRC053. The stream of positive informational and inspiring content John provides is second to none. Even though I don't always make the healthiest of choices, I am grateful that I have a positive voice in my ear pushing me to do better. Wow, thank you so much for leaving me that review over on iTunes. It truly means the world to me. And it's not about being perfect, just like you were talking about. It's just about progress. And I appreciate you sharing some of your story, and I promise to keep the good stuff coming. Everybody, thank you for leaving these reviews over on iTunes. Pop over there and leave me a review if you've yet to do so. It takes like 20 seconds. All right, you can actually pause this and come right back. I'll still be here. I'm on demand for you. But that would mean so much. And on that note... Let's get to our special guest and our topic of the day. Our guest today is the one and only Sean T. And he's an American motivational speaker, fitness trainer, fitness motivator, television personality, and choreographer. And he's best known for his home fitness programs for adults and for kids, which include T25, Insanity, and Hip Hop Abs. And if you don't know about Sean T, you must be living under a rock somewhere. But it, again, if you happen to not know him, this is going to blow your mind today. And if you do know him, this is going to blow your mind today because we're diving in and talking about transformation and talking about his incredible story and all of the insights that it provides for you. And I'd like to welcome to the Model Health Show, Mr. Sean T. What's up, man? I'm good. I feel good. Thanks for having me here. So excited to be in your energy. I have to say, you know, I have been a fan for a while, so I'm I'm holding back my excitement. But I guess I don't need to hold it back anymore because <laughs> no, no, we're sir. together now. So. Yes, sir. Sean and Sean. Yes, but sir. Thanks for having me. Yes. It's my pleasure, man. I'm very, very grateful that you flew in to hang out with me. We're going to have a great time. And I'd love to – I know there's so much amazing stuff in your story, but I'd love for you to share with everybody. We're going to bounce around a little bit. 
but when did you fall in love with fitness? Man, I love this question, first of all. Uh, so what a lot of people might not know is that I gained 50 pounds in college. Um, I, we grew up not having a lot of money, so my family's on food stamps. And I mean, even to the point where in the middle of the night, I would sneak downstairs in my house and, you know, ball up some bread and put it in my underwear and sneak back upstairs so I wasn't caught in the kitchen. It's crazy. That's but uh, <laughs> so when I got to college, we got this food card. Yes. And so the food card, you know, I got grants and scholarships. So the food card, I was like, this is free food. Yeah. And so um, <laughs> I happily went to the food court oh, yeah. all day long. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, I gained 50 pounds and I looked in the mirror one day and nothing started out with necessarily a number of how much I gained. It was more of, I looked in the mirror and I didn't feel good about myself. I didn't like what I saw. Yeah. I started working out. I actually went and started running on the treadmill. Yeah. Very simple, 10 minutes a day, because running is what I know. Yeah. Because I was a track and field athlete um, prior to that. And so the moment where I fell in love with fitness is when I lost about six pounds. I said to myself, the feeling of this, obviously 50 pounds heavier, only losing six pounds, you still have a long way to go, go right. quote unquote. But I, the feeling that I had of success and the feeling that I had of motivating, motivating myself and knowing that I could actually take over in the world yeah. with only losing six pounds, I said, I wanna do this for the rest of my life. I was like, I wanna figure out a way to make people feel this way yes. for the rest of my life. And oh, so man. that's when I fell in love with fitness. I love it, I love it. And prior to that, you were actually a track athlete, just killing the game with that. And um, I saw that you brought a lot of those um, gifts into the things you do later. I can see like a nice transition, but I wanna talk really quickly before I move on there was a time when you were going to the gym, you know, going from being like a, an athlete, like an elite athlete at the level you were at, to kind of tucking yourself away and hiding out because you gained all this weight. And of course, there's this uh, embarrassment that comes along with this. I know this intimately, I experienced the same thing. But when you first went to the gym, you made a comment in the book about not really wanting anybody to see you. Can we talk a little bit about that? Because I think a lot of people feel the same way. You are so visible when you walk into a gym, but you want to be invisible when you feel, when you don't feel good about yourself. Right. And so most people would say, what do you mean? You're 20 years old. You're fine. You're 19. You have the, you know, you're this young age. And uh, for me, I'm big, I'm loud, but I wanted to be invisible. And I remember going from the treadmill for the first time, going to walk through the door of the actual weight room where the weights were yeah. and pausing and saying to myself, if I'm gonna step in this room, I have to own it, you know? Mm -hmm. And it, I was right. so nervous to actually step into this room because you feel like you're gonna be judged. You feel like you don't measure up to anyone. And it was a very vulnerable place to be. Um, and and I, under, I've, I understand that in a deeper way now because of people who obviously talk to me and they're afraid to go into the gym and they're afraid yeah. to show who they are. And, you know, I, I even have a tough time going back to that moment now because it completely... It was a one thing that completely transformed my life when I was able to actually step foot into a place where I was absolutely uncomfortable. And so you really don't want to be seen, but everybody sees you. And the contrast of that is tornado-like because you're going back and forth between being really excited because you want to make a change in your life and your body, but also saying, well, can I do this without anybody seeing? Yeah. But you can't. So. Absolutely. Uh, and you, of course, you've helped millions of people. We're talking like over 10 million uh, of, your, of your fitness DVDs. And of course, it's streaming now. So we're talking about millions more of people to really help. You know, it doesn't matter where you are to start making those steps. And I love that about you, man. But also that little momentum you started getting and you made the statement in the book, and I say this all the time, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And so this is when you uh, had this intersection with somebody named Mandy Kern. 
Let's talk about the impact that she had on your life. Oh, man, this woman, still one of my best friends to this day. She was actually just on stage with me a couple of weeks ago when I was in New Jersey. So, you know, you're in the gym, you're doing all these things, and you're lifting weights, you're running, you feel really good about yourself, and then you see a group exercise class. And so you're kind of like, I just saw these girls in here, you know, on the yeah. step, they like to music, they're having fun. So I said, you know what? Let me roll up in this class one day. I talked to Mandy. She said, come on in. So I walk in and all the girls were, they had like three pound dumbbells. And I was like, I'm going to get eight. I'm going to get eight pound dumbbells. Yeah. You know, I was, you know, being all macho. <laughs> Swag, yeah. Man, minutes into the class, my arms were shaking. I'm trying to hold up this weight. <laughs> and she came over and, yeah. you know, was like, all right, let's change this out. But from that vulnerability and me allowing her to, to see my vulnerability and, and to be my teacher, yeah. uh, it was the most incredible thing because she actually taught me how to teach. She taught yeah. me how to teach aerobics, how to get in front of a room and help people understand that it's not about one particular person. And more importantly, it's not about you as an instructor, it's about helping people. Yeah. And so we really created an amazing bond where we developed fitness classes in college. We danced, she was the first person that taught me how to do it. A pirouette in jazz, you know? So she had a, a major impact in my life and where I am today. Yeah, yeah. I want to dive more into this because, you know, so many people, and I, I know we all do this, but we see the end result, you know, and you leading these amazing, like, thousands of people in instruction and reaching millions of people uh, in this group format. But you started from somewhere, you know, like started from the bottom, you know, and now you're here. Now I started but, <laughs> from the bottom, now I'm here. I was going to say that. <laughs> so, you know, one of the first time, no, the first time, and you you detail this in the book, and I want to make sure everybody go out and get this like yesterday. All right, Sean T, T is for transformation. It's going to blow your mind, the stories in here. But the first class that you taught by yourself, let's talk about that. In college, you put it out there, you put the flyers up. Let's talk about that experience. Man, so I have to kind of go back to that. So mind you, at in in college, I go to the parties. I'm in the middle of the dance circle. I'm, you know, I'm very outgoing. So when I changed my major from communications to sports science, yeah. you know, one of the things you had to do is teach group exercise. I was like, well, you know, I'm not doing Jane Fonda, you know, having my leg warmers on. Right. You know what I'm saying? I was like, I'm gonna do hip hop aerobics. So uh one of my building managers put on a program, uh, the Grind Workout by Eric Nice. Yeah. You know, he was from the real world and I saw this dance routine. I was like, this is dope. So I was like, I'm going to actually teach this routine. Put the flyers out there, get really excited, never having taught a class before. I don't know if it, I was not necessarily nervous. I was more excited because I'm just like, all right, this is cool. But when I walk into the gym and 90 people are waiting to take my mm -hmm. class when normally there's only like 15 people in a room, you kind of freak out. But you know what? 90 people were there. The building manager came up to me and said, you know what? You have to teach two classes back to back. And in, your, in my brain, I'm like, okay, so I've never taught one class. But, you know, I, I have this saying now, when you roll into the carnival, anything can happen. Mm -hmm. And so actually the Fuji said that back yes. in the day. <laughs> yes. And so I go in there, I turn on the music, and it was the most amazing and overwhelming feeling. I felt like I was home. I was like, this is where I'm supposed to be. And it wasn't about me. It was about the music and getting people to feel good. But it was also about the fact that you can literally go into a place and to end into a space where you can fit, forget about everything that's happening right, yeah. outside, all the stresses of college or all the stresses of life. And so being a group exercise instructor was that day completely, again, changed the course of my life. Yeah. And also exercise became, I hate to say it like this, but exercise became my drug, you know? Right, it right. became, it literally, get, going into that group exercise class healed me from a lot because being depressed and, and stressed about a lot of things that was I was transitioning and going through in my life, going into that room and having these people around mm -hmm. and being able to give so much of yourself was yeah. incredible. So yeah, 90 people showed up. I took two classes back to back. And then um, Tina Pinocchi is her name. I remember her saying, so do you want to get on a group exercise schedule? And then I said, 
Well, I stole Eric Nice's choreography, so <laughs> now I actually have to learn how to dance. You know, I have to learn how to choreograph. And yeah. so I went out and got Hip Hop Body Shop. I could be dating myself. I went to Sam Goody and got Hip Hop Body Shop and um, with this guy Milo. And I used to take his routines and go into the group exercise studio and learn it. And then I would teach the people that came. But then it eventually it came down to me having to push myself to learn choreography, right. to teach choreography, just to be able to break down choreography, to keep it new yeah. and keep it fresh. And so, I love yeah, you. it was great. Man, and you talk about this in the book, and we'll definitely talk more about this, but like getting out of your comfort zone. And that was the first step for everybody listening. He didn't just arrive, you know, it was uh, an initial step of getting out of his comfort zone, being uncomfortable and going to the gym that day and saying, you know, things have to change. And it led to this, these successive events and putting you in more discomfort and more discomfort and more discomfort, but you found what you love and you found what, what your gift is through that process. And what a great story because you went from teaching zero classes to teaching two on the first day and, uh, you know, really had to step up to step up to the plate in that opportunity. But also, you know, you mentioned that you were going through some things and you, you really share this beautifully in the book in a way that's so relatable and it evokes so much emotion, both uh, happy and sad and, and elated and fearful in the book. And you talked about, you know, some of the issues you had growing up. And I love if you kind of, you know, dive in and share this with us because uh, a big part of this story was who you called your step monster. Mm. All right, so let's talk a little bit about that. How could somebody uh, deserve, and rightfully so in the book, uh, a name like that? So I'm going to kind of go to a little bit of a dark place here, but it obviously it has a brighter ending. Um, you know when someone tells you they love you, it's an overwhelming feeling. Now, if you take that as a kid and you have a parent who shows you off to friends and they tell everyone, oh, like, I love this person. And th this person wasn't my biological father, but took us in and really said, hey, I'm going to let everyone know that this is my son. And we kind of looked alike. So you get really excited about the fact that there is a figure there that loves you beyond. This is a, an, a great feeling to have as a kid. But then one night at two o'clock in the morning when you're asleep and you feel someone walk in to your room and kneel down next to the bed and start caressing your back end and then you realize who it is turmoil immediately ensues it's shocking and you don't know what to do you freeze you don't know whether to yell scream run kick the wall, punch the person. But from the history of knowing who this person was and how they manipulated my entire family, the path that I chose at that moment was to sit still, be quiet. And that to me was becoming the hero because if I said something, would I die? Would this person um, go after my mother again? Would this person go next door to my brother and hurt him? And so it would start with the caressing of my butt and then I would have to turn over and endure a sexual act from a grown man. And this is, I'm at eight years old. And this happened over and over and over and over again. And I know this is a PG show, but I'm being fully transparent until the point at which a male knowingly reaches puberty and we know what happens when that happens and the minute that I reached puberty it all stopped but here's the thing that was the toughest part of the journey for me that particular journey I said I can endure this I can take this I'm doing this for my brother I'm doing this for my mom I'm taking one for the team for my family but there was a time when all of that happened at night it was always I heard the car pull up in the driveway. I heard him walk into the room and have an argument with my mom downstairs. He would walk upstairs, go into the bathroom, turn on the light with the fan, and then close that door so everyone thinks he's in the bathroom and then comes into my room. And so that's how it happened most of the time. But there was a time where I had a, 
this is a very emotional part for me, but there was a time when I had a science project at school and I was so excited and all week I've been asking to go to this Edmund Scientific. It was this amazing scientific store and I knew that I can get anything there because I was very creative. And so my mom and my brother were out for the day and it was just me and the step monster at home and I'm, it's during the day. So the daytime is safe for me yeah. and I could have interactions with him and know that nothing is going to happen. So I felt free to say, hey, I'm ready to go to the store. I'm ready to get my science project. I'm thinking he's actually going to help me with it. But instead he said, well, before I take you there, there's something that you have to do. And so I, the, the sexual abuse progressed to daytime. And I know some people might say, well, nighttime or daytime, it doesn't matter. But when you have to then lay on top of this person and when you have to then perform a sexual act on this person, it takes it to a whole nother level. And it literally, you thought you were three feet under, you're literally five feet under. You're literally one foot away from wanting to give up in life in general. And this is from someone who says that they love you. And now you have to pay them via sexual act to try and get an A grade in a science class. The amount of emotions that goes into that is so unbelievably overwhelming that I literally am surprised I, I'm here today. Mm. But I am. And um, yeah, it was, it was terrible. It was a terrible situation. But, and not to cut too far ahead, but that's the moment where I started to devise a plan. Yeah. I said, I have to get out of this toxic environment. And telling my mother or telling my brother wasn't the thing to do. It was, you know, at that point it's fight or flight. Yeah. And so I chose flight, but I was very strategic in my planning and I in a in a in a in a very young child's way. It took a couple of years. But I was very strategic and I was like, I have to get out of this situation. And I endured a little more of the abuse. Um, but I said, I have to go. And that's why he, that's why the name is Step Monster. Yeah. Um, I actually didn't even want to say his name. I don't even think he deserves to have <laughs> yeah. the name. Right, right. I, I agree, man. It, it was like gut wrenching and. You know, these are the things that evoke that emotion of like, would somebody help this baby, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's still like a great lesson for all of us to be more aware of our environment and also to be more aware of how, you know, we're raising our kids, you know, because I truly believe hurt people hurt people. And nobody should be in a position where these kind of things could even happen, even in a mental space. You know, there's obviously some, some deep rooted issues on all parts, but you were able, and this is what you said in the book, and this was really profound. You said that the more struggles you've had, the stronger you can be, mm. right? And your strength is just immaculate, like the things you've accomplished, but you went through something that's, you know, horrific. And your plan eventually landed you with your grandparents. So let's talk a little bit about that because they showed up like real saving grace. You know, they say my grandfather was a pastor, and so I learned my entire life that Jesus Christ is your personal savior, you know, get saved again. And they were my saviors. They really were um, by letting me. I mean, I moved out when I was, I moved out of that toxic environment when I was 14 years old. And, um, and I said to my grandparents, so I told you I devised this like immaculate plan. And it was literally me saying to my grandparents, you know, you guys are getting older. It would be mm -hmm. great to have a young person around the house, wouldn't it? You know, I would. I can help with chores. I can mow the grass. I was allergic to grass. They knew I wasn't mowing the grass. <laughs> um, right. And, but you know, my grandparents were so incredible. They knew there was a reason why I wanted to get out. They knew it was something bigger, but they never asked. There was never any pushback. It was like, sure. And my grandfather, full disclosure, probably wanted me to be a pastor when I grew up anyway. So he, and he never had a son. Mm -hmm. So for him, he probably was like, I can mold this young man into, you know, yeah. taking over my church. But I'm like, I'm here for it. But I'll tell you this, the first day that I left home, um, 
I actually don't remember the journey to my grandparents' house because it was only a mile away. But that night, I laid in bed and I laid down for the first time. And feeling at peace for the first time evokes an emotion that you cannot even understand. And I remember crying like I was, I think it was the four years of abuse coming out at that moment. And my grandparents came running into the room and they were like, you know, they thought I was very unhappy that I left home. And I'm like, I'm so happy. I was, I still, I'm like, I'm so happy. And they did what they did. They kneeled down and they prayed and I fell asleep. And I remember waking up the next day and that was my rebirth. That's when I was reborn. You know, to my grandfather, he would say re- being reborn is accepting Jesus Christ as your personal savior. And I'm like, I was reborn the day they let me come into the house. And man, the freedom of life is so incredible. And I want to go back to what you said about through struggle comes strength. Everyone out there has a secret backpack on. You, me, full disclosure, the guys in this room with us right now, everyone has something that they've been through, but a lot of people ignore the strength that they come with it because they just want to get past it and get over it. And they say, I'm past that point in my life. But there's something great about survival and everything that you survive. There's something amazing that you learn. So my challenge, even at this moment to anyone out there is, what happened to you? What was the struggle that you had? But more importantly, what tool are you pulling out of your secret backpack? What is the superpower that you have from that moment? And for me, I learned how to not become the victim. You know, I learned how, should I have said something? Everyone could say, yes, you should have said something earlier, or you should have told people, you should have told the counselor at school. But I didn't make that choice. But by not making that choice, what I built up was, an, an immense amount of power and, and self-motivation to know that I can get through a lot of things. Now, I didn't find it out until later in life after I went through therapy, trust and believe. I, you know, I had my struggles along the way. And, and at that moment at my grandparents' house, it wasn't over. But, you know, I just want to make a point that every step of the way of any struggle that you have, there's so much power in your life and in your body. I just want people to know, to grasp on not only to the negative things that happen to you, but when you get through it, there's something amazing that you get from it. Yes, man. And this is what's so remarkable about this book and about this work and about what you do, because so often, you know, we see people and we don't know their story, you know, the things that they've been through and that they've endured. And I think that it's so healing for us. It starts the healing process when we hear other people's story. Mm. It encourages us to do the same thing because we've all been through stuff. It might have been a different uh, flavor of uh, a tra- traumatic event, but we've all been through stuff. And something, al- there's always a gift somewhere, you know, and you made that very clear. One of these gifts was actually helped to develop by your grandfather and seeing the way that he moves in the world, the way that he speaks. And you said that uh, the way that you talk today, you know, and how you kind of engage and inspire others comes from him, right? Oh, man. So we, so my grandfather used to, we used to give away bread to people in, in communities that were even less fortunate than us. And so we would go to the farmer's market. And I talk about this in my book, which is a really fun story, but we would give all, we would give away all this bread. But in the process of giving away bread, my grandfather's like, hey, come listen to me speak on the corner of the church. And so as a kid, I would just be like, what is he talking about? You know? Right, right. And then we would go in, I was in church like three times a week, including gospel choir. And so my grandfather was there most of the time and I would be rolling up and down the pews and I'm like, what is he talking about? I just want to go home. I want to go out and play. Not to realize that 30 years later, when I start to speak and bring out my internal power, I remember the first time where I really stepped outside of like the fitness, get a better body and into the the mental fitness part of things. And right. I, And I spoke for the first time and I got off stage and I was like, Oh, pop up. <laughs> you know, I said, Oh, pop up. Thank you. Um, and yeah, I take I take his I mean, you again, I speak a lot about him in terms of biblical stuff, you know. 
Jesus and, you know, being your personal savior and being born again. But I got a lot out of that, which is not necessarily the religious and religion part of things. It was more of the passion that he had for the belief in the people that he spoke to. And that's why I say to people now, I'm your biggest fan. Mm. I will ride. Sean, I'm talking to Sean, the the host of this show. (laughs) You might be a lot of people's biggest fans, but I'll, I'll rival you for the human, the, the, the biggest fan of all humans. Because, <laughs> no, and I say that in a joking way, but I really believe in people. Yeah. No matter, yes. I went to a prison a few years back and I was walking through the prison and it was very weird because you're in a prison and it's kind of like someone showing you around the prison. And I felt like guilty for being in the prison and walking around and looking at these guys and, the person who was escorting me through the prison said, no, you don't understand. You motivate them. Hmm. When your commercial comes on, they do the exercises until the exercises switch on the actual infomercial. So then I would look in there and some of the, the prisoners would look up and they would do the exercises or they would start doing hip hop abs or they would dance or do something. Amazing. And it sounds really crazy. And some people are like, oh, why would you celebrate that? And I'm saying, because they're going through a struggle. Yeah. We can't give up on people just because of what they've done. And we don't have to, so you don't have to forgive them, but there's always, if you're alive, you need to try and be better. And if I can help someone think better for just a second of the day, then I'm going to do that. Yes. Oh man, that's powerful. I I love that so much. Um, In the book, you also talk about, and this is just jump forward a little bit again, um, because there's a there's a process and you talk about how even after people make an improvement, they tend to see their old self in the mirror Mm. and carry some resentment about that. But you say that you need to love that old self. Let's talk about that. Man, everybody has, you can form the most amazing relay race with just yourself. And so I take it to track and field terms. If you, so, I'll start by saying this. Perfection is temporary. Change is constant, right? If you take Usain Bolt, the greatest sprinter of all time, hands down, when he finishes, when he wins that 100-meter gold medal, guess what? He has to reset and refocus for the 200. And then when he wins that, he has to reset and refocus for the 4 by 100 meter dash. And guess what? Four years later, when the Olympics came up again, he had to do it again. Yeah. It's fine that you won last time, but how are you going to continue to win this time or what, how are you going to prep and go? And so I use a positive uh, example by winning gold medals because, you know, a lot of times we talk about the negative thing, but in life, you can create your own relay race. If you go back, people say, I never want to be that person again. Well, you know, I'm actually sick of seeing the before and after pictures. I want to know what happened before the before picture. Mm. Who's the person that made you get to the before picture? Because that's the strongest person you will ever know because that's the person that actually decided that you needed to make a change. That's the person who endured all the struggle. That's the person who was doing the binge eating or the stress eating, right? This person is the most amazing person you know. Eight-year-old Shawnee, as my family calls me, is the most amazing person I know. I still talk to him to this day. He was the first leg of the relay race of my life. So don't give up on your old self. Don't take your old self and say, I never want to be that person again, because you still are that person. You're an enhanced version of that person, and that is your biggest motivator. Mm. So you know what? That's, that's leg number one. And they have handed the baton off to the person that decided to make a change. And that person handed the baton off to the person that now has that quote unquote after photo. But what are you going to do when you take that after photo? What is the real reason for taking an after photo? Because it's great to share with the world and share that moment in time. But that person has to continue the journey and pass the baton on to the person who's going to help you sustain those results. So the person you are now, just because you might be at your quote unquote goal weight, is not more important than the person that was 40, 50, 100 pounds heavier. You're one person. You have one body. You've all worked together to get where you are and you built strength along the way. Oh, yeah, man. That's remarkable. And I love the uh, making it an example with the relay and thinking about that first leg. And for all of us, you know, we can think about to those earliest memories and how we helped 
ourselves to get to where we are, you know, and it really is a helping yourself process, you know. Um, but of course, there are people along the ways, different types of relays. Oh, yeah. The, the medley, you know what I'm saying? But there's <laughs> oh, also, <you> know. <laughs> yeah, there's also that um, that version where you are handing it off to yourself and the different versions of you. And everybody right now, I think it's important to understand you're still in process. You know, you haven't hit the anchor yet and there's still opportunity to grow and to transform. And thank you, man, for sharing this because you're inspiring us to to focus back on that. And I think that's a big reason why people are tuning in right now because they know there's another they know that there's another level. So with that said, you've got some great strategies in the book. The exercises are phenomenal. I didn't know what to expect with that part. You know, the story <laughs> was great and the the insights, but I was like, what actually kind of tangible things can we do? And they're phenomenal. And we're gonna talk about some of those and more of this incredible story of transformation with Sean T right after this quick break. So sit tight, we'll be right back. Welcome back. We are talking with the one and only Sean T about his amazing story and his new book, T is for Transformation. Make sure to go pick it up ASAP. It's something you definitely need to have in your library. And one of the things we touched on earlier I want to dive more into is comfort zones. All right? And you talk about how real progress doesn't begin until we move outside of our comfort zone. So first of all, what are some of the comfort zones that pe people can find themselves in? Food zones, relationship zones, work zones, money zones, uh, <laughs> life zones. I mean, just, you know, being very specific in that sense, you know, food zones, mm -hmm. people don't want to change the way they eat because of accessibility, but they don't, mm -hmm. they're not flexible to go and maybe change the roadmap to say, maybe there's other food that's accessible on a better journey or relationship zones. You know, some people stay comfortable in a relationship because they both it's it's financial. Yeah. They're purely in a relationship because of the finance. I don't have anywhere else to live, so you'll yeah. endure the pain of the relationship that's not good for something that you can actually change that's tangible. Or as far in in terms of work, you know, your people say, "Well, this job is all I have," but you can actually continue the job that you have, but also make changes in yourself, progress in that job so that you can become more marketable somewhere else. Right. And so, you know, also obviously we've all heard life begins at the end of your comfort zone. You wouldn't start a journey if you were afraid to be uncomfortable. So make take that uncomfortability and put it in all aspects of your life. Love it. You know, there's in the book, these exercises are phenomenal, and I, I did them. There's many, there's a lot of them in the book, and I wanna go through a couple of them. Okay. Uh, so this is Sean T's Discomfort Development Plan. Cause you yeah. might hear this, like you need to step outside your comfort zone. How, yeah. right? How do, how do I do that, Sean, you know? And so you actually give some strategies. So the, one of the exercises is to put yourself in an uncomfortable position, all right? And this could be like on the fitness side of things, what could people do to do that? Um, so I have many, I'm not sure if um, I'm going to say one that's in a book, but uh, I say for people who like to lift weights, I talk to a lot of guys because, you know, I know guys want bigger biceps, big chest. I literally challenge you to go into a group exercise class where you look mm -hmm. at a class that's mostly full of women and you're like, oh, please, like I can do these amount of pushups. So I can do that. I'm telling you right now you will be challenged and changed within yeah. that hour because it's different. And and I say that because that's what I did. I was like, oh, this is nothing. This is a whole bunch of like girls. They're fit. I admire them. I'm I'm about it. But you know, I'm strong and I humbled myself. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things you can do fitness wise is to humble yourself. Change the narrative. Change the narrative of your every day. Because if you do you will open yourself up to so many new opportunities. One switch of the narrative can completely change the course of your life because of a person you meet, a relationship you have, the way you feel as far as fitness goes, the way you feel yeah. two days later, something, a muscle that sore that may, you didn't even know you had because you tried something new. So change the narrative. It's only going to enhance who you are. Oh, man. You know, 
there's something really profound, and I know everybody's experiences, when you actually try something different, you try a new exercise or a new exercise program, especially something that, you know, maybe somebody else uh, put out there for you to do, you start, you sweat faster, you know, <laughs> yeah. like things start happening at a faster rate. You get out of breath faster. And it's because our nervous systems get entrained doing that same thing. We get caught in that comfort zone over and over and over again. So I encourage you, not even just for the physical body change, but uh, that we notice, you know, with the muscles and all that stuff, but your nervous system, right? Getting that new stimuli. And these are one of the things that helps to keep us young longer, mm -hmm. you know, that really helps with that whole, this is a huge term now today, this anti-aging process. Keeping your brain younger is changing up your exercise programs, doing something outside of your comfort zone, and it's just going to bring more improvement. And that doesn't mean you have to abandon, you know, the, doing the squats. You and know, what that's you your love. Thing, but just throw this in the mix, you know, and also brings a new flavor, variety, and uh, helps one of those needs that we all have. You know, we have a need for certainty, but we also have a need for uncertainty and mm -hmm. variety. And you can bring that to your exercise program. And I love that. And you talk about different areas and how we can uh, proactively move into the discomfort. But um, another one is <laughs> find more adventurous friends. This is a way to push you outside your comfort zone. Why is that? Man, because see what happens is it's Saturday night and you I don't know, I'm saying you can love all your friends. I'm I'm told I'm about it. You should have your fab five, you know, yeah. your core five people that bring you up. But it's very important to get a different perspective on because most of the time when you're with a certain group of people, you think the same way and you surround yourself with people who are like minded and it's great and it's fun. But find someone who's going to literally take you outside of your comfort zone to a point where you don't want to do it. And I do, <laughs> yeah. and I do that to a lot of my friends all no, the time. No, I wouldn't. I'm that. like, let's. <laughs> I remember. So we were on we were on um, we were on tour in Europe, yeah. and we started getting into this thing where. It was, we would finish an event or we would go somewhere and then people would go to a restaurant and then it was, let's have a, a bottle of wine and let's find, you know, the club to go out to. Now, mind you, I wasn't going out to clubs, but they were. So they yeah. were doing these same things. I said, I'm going to change the narrative in the next city. And so we got to Amsterdam and I did one of those. Have you ever heard of like a break room where you have to like, mm. so you and a group of people go into a room and you have to, you have to find your way out. By yes, doing yes. all these clothes. They have that here too, yeah. And I was and I and people were like nervous because we had to meet in some random parking garage in the middle of Amsterdam at like ten o'clock at night. It's dark, no one knows who it is, and then there's some random guy that says, Go find this car, and then you start this crazy journey. Yeah. Most of the people were like, This is crazy. I don't know if I want to do this. But it did. And when we finished, we had an amazing conversation of how you literally were able to work together and work with people who you think you would argue with, you know, before. <laughs> yeah. And it really changed the dynamic and a huge dynamic shift for the rest of the tour. We got along well beforehand, but after that, the amazing way to communicate because you switch up something you normally do. And here's the other thing I want to say in terms of relationships and you're married, you know, I'm married. We, 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 everyone out there has some sort of relationship. Yeah. And so when you're in your relationship and you might be going through a tough time and at home is where you talk about it, mm -hmm. this is the worst thing you can do. You need to, t you need to go outside and talk about it. Go to the park, go to an amusement park and talk about it. Change mm. your location. And yeah. that's what these yep. friends who are, changing up people and changing up friends will do they will change the location a different space a different physical space with different with a different background and a different look and a different feeling will make you react differently than staying in the same place that you're always in totally man and you know because we have these neuro associations you know you're in certain places in your house there are certain things certain brain patterns are firing <laughs> yeah. you know these synaptic connections it's a real thing i love that it's such a great tip and that's something that i've utilized but i've never spoken out loud before you know even changing your environment that's so fascinating and you know there's another i mean there's so many here man and also you have these little cool featurettes in the book that you call the truth bombs oh yeah and one of them is if you want to change your outputs, change your inputs. inputs. Yes. So let's talk about that one. What does that mean? Sorry to cut you off. That's one of my yeah. favorite truth bombs. If you want to change your outputs, change your inputs. What are you letting into your mind? What are the things that you're actually digesting 
in your brain. Forget about the digestive system. What mm. are the things that, what kind of conversations are you letting take place in your circle? How are you perceiving conversations that are happening around you? Are you looking at the positive part of the conversation so that you can actually digest the good from it so that you can maybe respond in a better way? Or are you always feeling like you're being attacked? Are you always getting involved in the gossip? And so that's just that's just in general everyday terms and interactions with people terms. But if you want to change your outputs, change your inputs for food. If most people say, I can't lose weight, and what, I'm like, so, okay, the first thing I ask them, so what are you eating? I eat really healthy. Great. Tell me what you're eating. Well, you know, sometimes I have. <laughs> right, yes. And I'm like, okay, so yeah. I, I'm, we're, this conversation's over, so now you already know what you need to eat. Or go listen to my man, Sean. But, you know, so that's number one. Yeah. Um, if you want to change output, change your inputs. If something is making you unhappy, be it your job, or your relationship, or whatever it is, change the, change the input. What kind of conversation are you having with your boss? What are you actually putting into the job? Because what you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. So it's not everything that, it's not always everything that comes to you. It's what you actually do with something that's actually tangible. The, 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 every, the thing that all of us have is a choice. We all have a choice in almost Absolutely. everything that we yes. do. And so if you choose to put goodness into this mixture, goodness is going to come out of it. So to change your outputs, change your inputs. Invite good into your life, into your body, into your soul. And here's what I can promise you. Good will happen from that. Man, thank you. And if somebody knows, you know this, you know, firsthand experience and also getting millions of people's lives you impacted. Um, and I, I want to go back and just touched on this because this is something I've been talking a lot more about recently because, you know, the Model Health Show, we're really about helping people to have health and, and prosperity in all areas of life because not one thing makes up your health. The food mm. you eat isn't the only thing that makes up your health. Being a clinical nutritionist, I start off like food is everything, you know, <laughs> food matters, that's it, you know. And now, you know, having this much more global perspective and seeing, of course, food matters, but so does your relationship. So does the job that you're doing. Mm. Because if you spend, you know, eight hours sleeping, that's a third of your life. You spend eight hours, you know, doing everything else, eating, hanging out with your family. There's another eight or 10 hour chunk where you're doing work. And that's like another third of your life. Plus, if you spend that doing something that you hate, mm. we're going to have some physiological, biochemical issues because stress is chemistry in your body. And so when you mentioned changing the, your perspective at work. That's so profound because, and you're saying that the good things are gonna happen, this is true. But most of the time we think when I get this other job or when I get to this other place, then I'm gonna bring my A game. Do it now. Bring more uh, compassion, understanding, perseverance, creativity to your job now, the job that you're in, and show the universe that you're ready to go to that next level. I'm ready, I'm prepared, I'm gonna bring my A game, I'm doing it now, just give me that new thing. But it's not something that's going to happen, you know, in the future. And all of a sudden, yeah. I'm changed. You know, it's like start now. Start where we are, where we, where you are with what you have, and that's going to create the bridge to that new level. Yeah, I do want to say, um, just to add to that, I know a lot of people who are unhappy in their job, and they do say, "I just want to go to the next job." But here's my thing: if you know it's going to be a little tough to just leave and get to that next job, yeah. why don't you? work as hard as you can to get a promotion in the job that you have. Literally, debunk the theory that, you know, my boss doesn't like me. Make them like you. Mm. Do, do something a little bit different. Don't just sit at the desk, read your emails, send emails, and go home. Walk into the office. Is there anything else I can do for you today? Because I'm doing the same thing every day. So you let me know how I can help you. Just that small bit of communication can change the course of your entire job. And you can get a promotion, which makes you more marketable, which then you can say, thanks, I gave all my positive energy or all the positive energy that I got here, and now I am more marketable somewhere else. Yeah. Now I can go get that job. Now I can walk into another interview and feel good about the fact that I've worked so hard and created such good energy in a space. And you know what? That job that you hated before is going to be the job that gives you the the recommendation 
to please hire this person. Yes. So use what you have to get what you want, but make sure it's good so you can get good from it. Oh man, you know, this is some this is a truth bomb. You got truth bombs all in this book, <laughs> just this featurette. <laughs> but this is a truth bomb because when you were talking just now, it reminded me of I didn't just arrive here, you know, same thing, you know. I I remember even early on, 18, 19 years old, uh, we'll say in between colleges at the mm -hmm. time. Okay. And I was working at a casino. And this is not a place you want to be, if, especially if you're a kid. It's just a, I learned about life. It was like a real life soap opera there, you mm. know, with like the, the the relationships and the cheating. It's like, oh, people do this. It's it was like a real life Big Brother episode. <laughs> yeah, I lived in it, man, you know, and I became a part of it. And I really learned a lot about, you know, human psychology, how people operate. But even then at that job, I was striving to execute, mm. to do the best job possible, to get everybody out of there. And I ended up being the manager of the department. And I'm like 18, 19 years old. And of course, and I heard to deal with the politics of that, you know, like, who is this kid telling me what to do? You know, these people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, who I'm now the boss of. It's like, how is that even possible? I didn't just show up like this. I was already executing in these other phases of my life, you yeah. know, and just bringing that attitude of execution and service, actually, you know, like I wanted my team to be, you know, um, able to, to help people to the way that we did our job, because we are interacting with people when we're asking them to get out the way so we take the money out the machine, <laughs> yeah. you know, but a kindness, you know what yes. I'm saying? And, and compassion, which is so weird that I, I, I haven't even thought about this in years, but you know, it's very, very true guys. So again, I, I, there's a saying of like, love the one you're with, you know, but just bring that attitude to it now. I promise that if anything, you're going to be happier, at being where you are, but if your ultimate goal is to be somewhere else, it's going to help to create that pathway. And uh, one other thing, and there's so, again, this is just one chapter of, of exercises here and conversations to have, but I want to talk about this one really quickly, which is to expose yourself to new ideas. Mm. This is a really powerful way to get outside your comfort zone. Yes. Let's talk about that real quick. Well, first, I do want to say, which I don't think I said earlier, that um, you know, getting uncomfortable is superpower number one. Because yeah. the minute you actually start any journey, you're putting yourself in an uncomfortable situation because you want to achieve something that you don't have. And the only way to achieve something that you don't have is to get uncomfortable. And so my, my challenge and question to you is how uncomfortable do you want to get? Because the risk have, has to match the reward. And so... Yeah. If you want to achieve great things that are passionate and that you're passionate about and that you that makes you thrive, then the road to that type of success is going to be extremely uncomfortable every single day. And I say uncomfortable, uncomfortability for me is fun. Yeah. You know, yes. I, I'll use this example, which might not be the best example, but confrontation. See, a lot of people are afraid of confrontation. And, you know, I, I talk a lot about relationships because I think interpersonal relationships kind of drive a lot of our existence throughout the day, whether it's work or whatever. But I love confrontation because I can change confrontation into an amazing positive thing. Yeah. Some people get sweaty palms when they have to approach somebody. My thing is I know at the end of this conversation, because I'm going to bring positivity to this conversation, that not only are we going to have a better relationship, but the things that we can do together will create greatness and so and i do want to say i'm not perfect in any way shape or form and when you read the book you'll know that i made some mistakes and even today i still make mistakes but i invite the mistakes and i invite the turmoil because life is a journey not a destination there are no mistakes just chances we've taken mm. and india Ari says that lay down your regrets because all you have is now so what are you actually going to do right now and I'll answer that for you. Get as uncomfortable as possible. Do something uncomfortable every single day of your life. When you do that, it will be almost like reading a book or taking a class or a college course because not only are you learning about something amazing, but you're learning something that you will be able to utilize in other conversations and take in all different areas of your life. Not just, I'm better at math, which math is great, or I'm better at science. So I'm, but if you actually take, if you actually do something new and different and uncomfortable every single day, you're gonna actually help someone else who might be struggling with the same thing. Right. So invite the turmoil, just mix it with some good. And mm -hmm. at the end, 
that uncomfortable feeling is going to turn out to be the most amazing thing you've done. Oh, wow. You know, this is something else that, and I know that you have found a way to invite it in and in, in a strange way, kind of fall in love with the discomfort, you know, and if we can start to even change our perspective like that, that it doesn't have to be like world shattering, that kind of thing, but to find a way to embrace it and to love it, you start to not necessarily realize that you're doing this anymore. Because again, it's something I do on a daily basis. I'm very motivated by growth. And with that growth comes, you know, like I'm going to have to get outside my comfort zone. And on a daily basis, just finding little opportunities to do that. So, so fascinating. Now, let's talk about <laughs> time. All right. This is one of the big things people use as their... Um, their reason, we'll call it a reason, mm -hmm. for not being able to execute on their fitness or invest in their relationships or whatever the case might be. But a lot of people build all kinds of busyness, and this is what you say in the book, a lot of people build all kinds of busyness into their lives as a way of crowding out difficult questions. Mm. All right, so we create all this busyness in our lives so we're not asking these difficult questions. Let's talk about what that means. Okay. And then we'll go from there. Well, I first want to say to that, it's not the thing, it's the thing, right? Yeah. It's not the thing, it's the thing. And what we do as humans is we sometimes run away from the conversation. You know, it's the elephant in the room, you know? We, we fill our day with so many things. We imagine you're unhappy at home. You're going to schedule lunches. You're going to do extra workouts at the gym. You're going to have to stay late at work, you're gonna, you know, there's, you're gonna crowd your life up with something so you don't have to address the issue. Yeah. And so that's why I say, it's not the thing, it's the thing. Most of the time when you are going through something in your life, I'm not mad because you didn't put down the toilet seat. That's not why I'm <laughs> mad. I'm mad because we haven't been intimate. You know, mm -hmm. that's why I'm mad. And we haven't yeah. talked about that. And we haven't talked about the fact that our sexual interests are changing. So let's talk about that because it could actually be really fun if we allow ourselves to explore something else. So stop crowding your life with things that don't matter and, and you know, styrofoam filler because I hate when a box comes with a lot of styrofoam. I'm like, why don't you just put it with a smaller box? <laughs> right. You know, this is a lot of extra. Yeah. You know, it's hurting the environment. So let's stop filling our lives and crowding our lives with things that don't matter and let's actually talk about what's really going on. Yeah. Because the sooner you get to the problem, the sooner you can have fun. And and I know it's a PG show, but I say that in in in, in terms of like with your spouse. It's like we had sex in four weeks. Why? Like, don't get mad. At, don't get mad and act out. Let's talk about why we haven't done that. And yeah. so, I'm telling you, you have this conversation and you open your life up to it. You won't be crowding your life with just things you didn't really want to go to the grocery store. You wanted to have sex with your spouse. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So start talking about the thing. It's not the thing, it's the thing. So stop crowding your space and your life with things that don't matter. And once you start to, you get the more you talk about the things that do matter and you crowd your life with things that do matter, oh my goodness. Yeah. Then you can really understand and believe that you matter. Yes. And again, in the, you, you do such an amazing job. I mean, I, I was just really blown away at helping people to dissect and give exercises because it's just like, this sounds amazing. How do I do that for myself? So again, that's in the book. Each chapter has these really great exercises and just questions to act, ask yourself. And when you talked about this, about crowding out difficult questions, you give those questions that we need to ask ourselves to start opening up our perspective. And questions really are the answer, mm. you know, at the end of the day. And um, thank you for sharing that in the book. Now, last thing. So with this idea of time, you know, people give that as their number one excuse for not working out. Mm -hmm. And you've just like blown that out of the water. All right. So how do you do that? I know how you do it. I know there's a lot of people listening, but there's some people who have yet to know this. How do you erase that as being that excuse? Time? Yeah. Um, well, first I'll say excuses are tools of incompetence that build monuments into nothingness and those who specialize in them seldom accomplish anything else. So oh, man. Oh, man. the more, yes. the more, and listen. Listen, people, I'm looking to the camera now, just in case people are watching. It's fine. We all make excuses because we don't want to give ourselves the time. And that's what it comes down to. You don't want to give yourself the time. And you have to ask, why don't you give yourself 
the time. What is the thing that's blocking you from giving yourself the time? I believe that time doesn't really exist. It only exists on a clock. It's what you put into it. Mm. So time is really the energy you put into something. A deadline is a deadline. I get it. But procrastination is a barrier. So give yourself time and yeah. stop making up excuses not to have time. Yes. Simple, powerful. And also the way that you've structured your programs. And and FYI, I used to make fun of it a little bit. Be like, <laughs> Which you, one? I, you know, when people be like, and I, I actually met somebody who was in one of the commercials and he was a patient that I used to work with. <sighs> And he got in incredible shape and he became like, this is one of the first times I saw an evangelist for you, right? <laughs> and I'm just, and I'm telling people, you know, like it's really about getting outside your discomfort, but you don't have to do these insane workouts, you know? So I was like, poke it fun. But I knew that the deeper thing is, it's not the workout, it's you, man. It's your your compassion, it's your, the, the motivation that you carry. And it's something different. It's like a deeper, I did a show recently called The Science of Motivation and how we can transition that motivation into inspiration because mm. motivation is external, this is internal. And you help people to really bridge that and they become their own source of inspiration. They're really inspired to, to keep pushing forward. And that's really what it is. And of course, the gift in creating these programs, making them fun, making them engaging. And you've done that on different levels, you know, whether it's the Insanity Program or the, the T25, right? So it's like even more condensed. And that's one of the ways we can get around that time excuse. Let's talk about that real quick, uh, the T25 and why that's uh, a good a, a good place of entry if people are saying they don't have time. Yeah, so you hear me say the number one reason people have for not working out is they don't have time. Yeah. And I say you just didn't give yourself time. And the second thing is you are a lot of time what we do is we work out because people told us this is how long we have to work out. Yeah. But what does your body need? And so I developed T25 because 30 minutes, okay, everyone knows you got to work out 30 minutes a day. So psychologically I'm saying I'm going to give you only 25 minutes, but let me tell you something. In that 25 minutes, we're going to progress to the exercise so you can feel successful, but you're also not getting any breaks. And so think about where half of 25 is, it's 12 and a half. You get the 12 and a half minutes and you're like, I can do anything for 12 and a half minutes. Great, now do it again. And so that's why I developed T25. It was more condensed and the motivation, it's, it's less crazy and less out of control, but it's more contained in a sense of, I'm right there with you. This is your time for the day. This is your time to be selfish, which is another superpower in a book being the good kind of selfish, which is giving yourself time because you are the nucleus of your existence. Yeah. Your, your family, your kids, everyone are the planets around you being the sun of your solar system. So if you give yourself 25 minutes a day, let me tell you something. That 25 minutes with no breaks of you working hard and believing yourself along the way will turn out to be a great thing. And I did want to say, I wanted to say thank you because you said... Um, it's not the workout, it's me. And that's because of what me and Mandy learned at young ages is the workout's not about me. It's not about me. Clearly, if I'm on the DVD, I know how to do a push-up. I can do a power jump really high. It's about you. And it's about giving. And it's about my grandfather instilling that power in me and saying, how do you want to, for him, it was his, you know, the church goers. For me, it's, it's the exercise goers, the people that want to work out at home. I want you to be successful. I do want to tell this story. With Insanity, it was um, such an, an, uh, an amazing program for me. I feel like it was the one program that put me on a map in fitness because prior to that, I was just the dance guy, Carl Deichler, who is the mm -hmm. CEO of Beachbody. He called me just a dance guy until I created Insanity. <laughs> He's like, oh, he is a fitness guy. But I wanted to say this. When no one knows... And I've never talked about this. I talk about it in a book, but no one knows. I never talked about it publicly. When I was going through insanity and creating insanity and shooting insanity, my grandmother was dying. Mm. And um, uh, so um, we did the test group. In the first 30 days of the test group, we shot the first month of the workout. 
and it was fine. And my grandmother had just had her 90th birthday and I'm like so excited. And she starts to decline. And so between the first shooting and the second shooting, I had my last, me and my grandmother and my grandfather used to love ice cream. We used to eat ice cream together. I was lactose intolerant, but it was with my grandmother. So I was doing it, you know, it was our, t- our thing. We went to the mall and we were walking through the mall and my grandmother is the, one of the most powerful people that I've, I know. She was my favorite person, obviously my, grand, my grandfather. And we're walking through the mall and we only get like 200 feet and she has to stop and take a break. And I start to break down because I see this person and breaking down. Now, mind you, I'm in the middle of shooting one of my biggest accomplishments. And so, you know, we have our last thing of ice cream and I had to go away on a trip to Spain. My mother calls me and says, I think you need to come home. My mom's not doing well. We get home or I get home. My grandmother hadn't opened her eyes in a couple of days. And my brother was the one that was, you know, washing her and cleaning her up every day. And so I'm in the room and I'm there and I'm like, please. I don't know if this was like a selfish thing or just a last minute I needed to connect with her and let her know that I'm here and I love you so much. And my brother was cleaning her. He, he said, my mom, you know, Sean's here. Like, you know, can you open your eyes? And she opened her eyes one last time and she mm. looked at me and kind of smiled and waved. And I tell you, man, talk about defining moments in your life and where Dig Deeper really comes from. And so not a few days later, she passed away. And a few days after that, we had her funeral. And a few days later, I had to go finish shooting Insanity. And so when people see me in Insanity in month one and month two, the entire program, and they say, I don't care about the exercise. I don't care if you do what I do. When I'm, there are points in insanity where I'm saying, you're right there. Like, I know you want to give up and I know you want to take a break and it's okay, but you're right there. And I was carrying this emotion with me through insanity. And I I know that's what my grandmother gave me the power to really push through and to motivate people and say, you know, continue to lead with the message that your grandfather instilled in us, our entire family. And she gave me that. And it just felt really good to get that out because I yeah. never talked about that before. Man, just thank you so much for sharing it because, wow, I mean, it's not an accident, you know, the the, the way that you impact people's lives and the, the, your story is just profound. And it's all, again, encapsulated in the book, so many pieces of it, but there's so much more. And I want everybody to make sure that they connect with you online, follow you on social, and make sure to pick up the book. Can you please let everybody know where they can find T is for Transformation? So you can find T is for Transformation at seantfitness.com slash book. Now, I know your guy, your guy Sean, spells it S-H-A-W-N. I'm S-H-A-U-N-T, uh, fitness.com slash book. Um, and then you can find me online on social media, which is just at Sean T. Um, and another thing I wanted to say, which I don't, I don't know if we have more to talk about, but I'm going into the next chapter of my life and we are having twins. Well, um, yeah. We found out we're pregnant and we're so, well, we're kind of far along now. I found out on my birthday, which is the most amazing and incredible thing of this year. Yeah. We had to keep it a secret for so long. And so I'm going to be going through my own transformation. So, yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, becoming a father is, is an amazing thing. And I, I even said to Scott, I said, you know, I think I'm going to have to like read my book again as a as a client yeah. as we go through this transition and transformation as parents. So I'm excited about that. too. I love it, man. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing your gift and your story. Um, I mean, I was just blown away. I was riveted. I told you I sat down. I read 100 pages in one sitting just the first time I sat down. Um, your story is remarkable. But also you kept referring it back to even through the uh, your your personal story back to us. Yeah. you know, and what we can take from it and what we can do to uh, improve our lives and to have our own transformation. And just thank you so much for being who you are, man. Thanks. I appreciate you having me. It's my pleasure. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning into the show today. Wow. I hope you got a lot of value out of this. And this was a big inspiration for you to get to your next level transformation. You know, Sean is somebody who has helped to really create a culture of, I think, physical literacy in our planet today and teaching us how to use our own bodies to become more fit. We have no excuses. 
and also providing that motivation until it becomes a part of us, until it gets our, its hooks in us and we become inspired ourselves to keep pushing forward. And that is beautifully encapsulated in the book. So again, make sure to check it out. T is for transformation. Uh, it's available right now. And guys, I'm telling you right now, uh, we've got some amazing, amazing stuff coming up, but this is what it's really about. It's that internal game. It's working on our mental muscles so that we could transform our physical muscles as well. And there's nobody better on the planet than Sean T to help you do that. Take care, have an amazing day, and I'll talk with you soon.